I want to focus for the next few minutes on uh, really two things. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about Abraham. And then I want to bring this to the part of the word that was given to us about the ancient markers. It's been very fascinating to me over the last couple of years as I've sought the Lord for revival in America, how much he has focused the prayers and the thinking on the ancient paths and markers. And I've been very intrigued by that. Lord, why are you doing this? I'm, <clears throat> I'm crying out more that we, that we find the ancient path and the ancient markers, foundations. I'm crying out for that more than soul, for souls. Because suddenly I have this revelation that if we don't find that, we will get the souls. And it's really taken me back and of the numerous dreams and words that have been sent to me over the last year or so. It seems like the theme that is reoccurring more than any other is America's purpose, destiny, which is the ancient path. It's only in going back to what he did then that we can find his dream for America. So I'm going to I'm going to honor what he said in that dream when he said convene a holy convocation so that we can find the ancient markers of the founding fathers. A young one of my young Sons, he's a he's a true wonderful leader in the body of Christ, but he's a son to me. And I was visiting with him recently, and he said, "I have I have a, had a dream I need to tell you about." He doesn't. I think he dreams a good bit, but I don't hear about it. I think a lot of his dreams are the Lord dealing with him and his ministry, what to do with that. But he said, I had a very short dream for you. He said, you came to my house, or to, I guess maybe his dad's house, to to visit with me. We were standing outside. And you saw my dad, his dad. You saw him in the yard, running around, dressed as a superhero with a cape on. And in the dream, I looked at him uh, quizzically. I, I was puzzled and taken back. And I said, called his dad's name. I said, why is Ike running around the yard dressed like a superhero with a cape on? And he said to me, that's not Ike. That's Henry. And then he told me, when he was relating the dream, that everybody calls his dad Ike. But his real name is Henry. Cape Henry. Superhero. And I said, was there anything else said? He said, nope, end of dream. But he said, I know God's talking to you about Cape Henry. And I said, Lord, what does this mean? Let me just let those of you that don't know, maybe some of you watching, listening that don't know. Cape Henry is where a group of the pilgrims landed in 1607. Under the spiritual leadership, they weren't weren't all believers, but the spiritual aspect of what they were doing, led by a man named Robert Hunt, a very godly man who came later the pastor at Jamestown. 
back about the time God started talking to me about the ancient markers. And that I need to go find them. They excavated at Jamestown and found Robert Hunt's bones. And I said, what a coincidence. I said, Lord, what does this mean? What are you trying to say to me? He said, the supernatural power, superhero, superhero. The supernatural power needed to overcome evil. Superhero. That's what they do. The supernatural power needed to overcome evil will be found at Cape Henry. From that day, I don't know if you've ever experienced anything like this. It was as though this place was calling to me. I found myself saying and thinking, I have to go back there. There's something for me there. It has to do with the ancient path. What is it? Then I, then I revisited what Robert Hunt prayed when they landed. He actually made them wait for three days before they disembarked. It had been a, a, a very, very difficult journey. It took them months longer than they expected. When they finally reached land, he still made them wait three days to fast and pray and separate themselves unto the Lord before they touched the land. You won't read that in your history book. Then after three days, they disembarked. They carried a cross that they had brought from England. And they planted that cross on the beach. And he prayed a long prayer. And this is part of it. We do hereby dedicate this land and ourselves to reach the people within these shores with the gospel of Jesus Christ and to raise up godly generations after us. Just let that sink in. To raise up godly generations after us. And with these generations take the kingdom of God to all the earth. May this covenant of dedication remain to all generations. As long as the earth remains. And may this land, along with England, be evangelist to the world. May all who see this cross, there's another one there now that they've put at Cape Henry to honor this occasion. There's a picture of it up here. May all who see this cross remember what we have done here. And may those who come here to inhabit join us in this covenant. I began to realize that God's destiny for America was to partner with him. That's a key word. 
It's like Abraham who partnered with God to give us Messiah. That God chose a man who was very imperfect. He was very human. God knew I can, I can transform this man into what I need. So he entered into a covenant with this man. And though Abraham didn't know it, he said the purpose of this is so you can partner with me to save the world. So you can partner with me to establish my kingdom rule here on the planet. And God navigated him through some difficult times. And I talk about that in my Appeal to Heaven book and message. God knew when he called Abraham, he would still face a point in his life more than once where he lied. Let's just say it the way we don't like to say it. For a while, he was a liar. He still had something in him that when push came to shove and he was threatened at a high enough level, he was willing to lie. And not only was he willing to lie, he was willing to lie about Sarah being his wife and say to the king, she's my sister, you can have her. That would be covenant breaking. At best. He knew he would commit adultery with his wife's maid. You can try to parse words all you want, put it in the context of that day. But since Genesis, God's law was, you sleep with somebody other than your wife, that's adultery and fornication. God knew that he would do that because of his unbelief. That with Sarah's dead womb and him pass nearly to the point of not being able to have children himself, God just, this, this just, the way God said he was going to do it just couldn't happen. So he took matters in his own hands. But God knew that in that era and in that day, when he wasn't under the blood of the Lamb and he wasn't born again, he was just a man trying to find his way through history without much of a compass, if you want to know the truth. Yeah. And he had an encounter with Almighty God and he knew it was real. And when he messed up, God was patient enough with him because God looked into the future and said, no matter what he does, I see what I'm going to do with him. And I know there's something in him that is going to overcome the unbelief and the covenant breaking and the lying. And before I'm finished with him, he will be a covenant keeping friend of mine and a man of unwavering faith. Because God didn't call him based on what he thought Abraham could do. God called, called Abraham based on what he knew he could do. And when he's finished with the cleansing and the sins are washed away, even under the blood of the old covenant, God said, they are no more. And I don't even remember them as far as the east is from the west. That's in the Old Testament. And my point to you, some of you heard me say this in the Appeal to Heaven message days. His weaknesses that God knew about before he called the man. Because God is Olam, eternal God outside of time, declaring the end from the beginning, seeing the end from the beginning. Before Adam ever fell, he'd already found the lamb. And God said, his weaknesses 
did not disqualify him. His failures did not disqualify him. But the time that 25 years was up, he was unwavering in his faith. He was God's friend. He was the partner that God said, he and I are going to save the world. And at the end of that journey, I wish I could roll back the clock, bind that clock. It work? Still says the same thing. You know the story, some of you. He planted an evergreen tree. which symbolized covenant in that day. Still does. Because it doesn't die every fall and have to produce new leaves. It's ever green. He planted one, a tamarisk tree, which grows very slowly. The roots go very deep. The scholars say no one would plant a tamarisk tree for his or her benefit, even though it was the best shade-producing tree in the land because the roots went deep and pulled up so much water that in the heat of the day, the, 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 the water would, what would be the word, Condens condensate? And you could sit under a tamarisk tree and, feel the coolness of that damp air. But they said no one would plant one for his or herself because they would know it grows so slowly. They'll never enjoy the fruit of it. They would only plant one for the next generation and the next generation. And the lexicon I was reading said that when Abraham planted that tree, he was saying to his kids and his grandkids and his great great grandkids, he was saying to Isaac and Jacob and the sons of Jacob, you will sit under the shade of my covenant with God. And in the same verse, he called on everlasting God. I don't have time to go in this, but Everlast, evergreen, in one verse. Everlast, the God outside of time who's bigger than my failures. Looks ahead to what he's going to make me. Reaches back, cleanses. The God who can do exactly what he said. The God, how did, you, how did you do this with me? But you did. And here's Isaac. And now, here we go. You're doing exactly what you said. In spite of my weaknesses, my failures, my humanity, you're doing it anyway. You are just eternal, omnipotent God that can do anything. And you can reach back, and you can reach forward, and you can see the end from the beginning. You are Olam. And he did all that at a place called Beersheba. Which means the well of covenant or the well of oath. Beer Shava, the well of oath, which was another word for covenant. When God was giving me the revelation of the two gloves that would be needed to take out giants, everlast and evergreen, in the dream, you can read the book, Appeal to Heaven, or listen to it on YouTube. But at one point, He said to me, it's not enough for you to read about it in Genesis 21, 33. I know you have the dream and you've read the verse about everlast and evergreen and my nature and covenant and that with those two gloves you can take out any giant, but it's not enough. I need you to go to Beersheba. And I went on a pilgrimage to Beersheba. And I stood there and simply said, whatever it is you want to put in me, I'm here, do it. 
I'm willing to go halfway around the world to partake of whatever's in this land right here. Then Cape Henry started calling out to me. God gave Clay another dream. A dream the morning of September the 9th that you issued a call to rally people to a point close to Cape Henry. I knew that was God because I was, I was already planning to go. Small team, he said. My pages are out of order up here. I think I can figure this out. But Take a team. As we obeyed and sought God, he spoke to us, gave us more dreams and strategy. Then I said in the dream, we're ready to put our feet at the place of the cross. Where the destiny of this nation was declared. The ancient marker of why we exist as a nation. To partner with God. To save the world. Take the kingdom of God and the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. And that is why we exist. And I said, we're ready to go in the dream. Then in the dream, I said this. We are ready to set foot on the land at the cross and see the well of oaths opened to flow to America. Remember I told you that's what Beersheba means. The well of covenant or oath. In the dream he called Cape Henry our Beersheba. The place where supernatural power exists to take out your enemies is the place of first covenant with me at Cape Henry. And if you go there now, remember Beersheba is where the two gloves were, everlast, evergreen. If you go and lock that covenant root once and for all, you can take out your enemies in this land with supernatural power. Did you get that? Are you sure? Once we arrived in the dream, once we arrived at Cape Henry, the cloud of witnesses appeared. Robert Hunt was probably there. Washington might have been there. Maybe Finney showed up. Maybe Billy Graham stepped over the balcony and checked it out. But Reese Howells came to us in the dream. A great intercessor. In the mid 1900s, whom most scholars, true, honest historians 
agree that probably Reese and his company of intercessors saved the world. Interceding and travailing prophetically and apostolically for up to sometimes 15, 18 hours a day. Praying for the allied forces and against Hitler's armies. Became so sensitive that God would tell Reese and his people at times what the enemy was going to do before they did it. And they would be praying about battles during World War II before the battles ever took place. And I've been told and read in history books that Winston Churchill once said, when Reese is praying, we win. He stepped forth from the cloud of witnesses. Prayed over us in the dream. His prayer said, let those assigned to break up the fallow ground plow deep. In order that the soil of this nation be prepared for the seeds of righteousness to be sown. Then we on to say, let the preparers of the soil do a quick work in order that the sower not delay the harvest. Because it's coming quickly. Reese then took off his coat and in the dream placed it on my shoulders. I know that's, I know it, I know it for lots of reasons, but I know that's not just about me. It's about what I represent. The prayer movement, the ecclesia, the praying church. He actually says that in essence when he speaks. So it's just, it was see it wrapped around us. That's what the dream is saying. He wrapped it around me and said, this is the coat I wore during World War II. Wow. And must be worn by the ecclesia in order to see the kingdom harvest that's at hand. He then hugged me. Clay said in the dream, he hugged me like a father would a son. One generation to another generation. Someone from the cloud to us here now. He hugged me. And he said, the training is finished. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It means Holy Spirit has brought us to an understanding that we are the ecclesia. We understand the fivefold anointings of Jesus are for today. We understand that not only his pastoral mantle as the shepherd and his evangelistic mantle as the savior and his teaching mantle as the great teacher there on the hillside, but that his prophetic mantle also and his apostolic mantle of government in the earth, the government of the king, all of those are alive and well and they've all been given to the church. And that we can now walk in the fullness of who he is. I'm going to say it again because I like to say it so much. Because you, if you're only walking as far as the gift and anointing that he's giving, if you're only, if you're only partaking of 20% or 40% or 60% of that, you can only represent and reveal 20, 40, 60% of who he is. But if you read the passage clearly, it says that when all of these gifts, anointings of Christ, Christos, the anointed one, who gave to us of his anointings, it said, I'm going to give you my apostolic anointing, my prophetic anointing, my evangelistic anointing, my teaching anointing, and my pastoral anointing. Now, with all of these things, we're going to partner to save the world. You're not only going to shepherd the flock, 
You're not only going to be my bride, I'm going to have a government. An extension of my kingdom authority in the earth. And it's going to be so real that whatever you bind in the heavens is what it really says in the passage. Whatever you bind in the heavenlies will be bound in the heavenlies, he said. Whatever you loose, and just so you know, those are governmental terms. Those are courtroom terms. They don't mean first and foremost binding as in tying something. They do mean that. But they originate from legal language, that which is legally binding. Courtroom. That which is loosed, uh, something legally binding is dissolved, as in dissolving a contract. I'm going to have a government, and I'm going to give them my authority. And I'm going to give them my anointing, and I'm going to give them my gifts. They will have my keys. And when I'm finished, the gates of hell will not prevail against this church. And you need to know that he meant exactly what he said. The gates. Some of you, you know your Bibles and teaching. You've been well taught enough to know that referring. That's a governmental term there. It was at the gates of the city where the ecclesia sat. The city council, the legislature of a city would meet at the city gate because it symbolized the place that where things were allowed to come in, go out, or not be allowed to come in and go out. So that became the place that symbolized government. He couldn't, it could not be any plainer. He was saying, I'm giving to my ecclesia, my kingdom authority, my governmental authority, and the government of hell will not prevail against them. And I know that we have been prevailed against. And I said it recently, and people freaked out when I said it, but I said it, I'll say it again. If he had come back before today, that passage would have been a lie. Because off and on, plenty of times, the gates of hell, the government of hell has prevailed against the efforts of the church. But just like with Abraham, he kept working. And he said, I'm not finished with this yet. I've got some things I'm going to pour out and restore and bring some revelation that they don't know about yet. He started a new phase of that back about the 60s, 1960. We had pastors and evangelists. And then he restored the revelation of the teacher. The charismatic move was all about the teacher. Bible schools and radio programs and breaking down scripture and teaching, 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 teaching. But even in that movement, it, that wasn't enough. And as a movement, the Jesus people movement, the charismatic movement, it still floundered, still got off course. In many ways, eventually, many segments of the movement made it all about us. All about us being blessed. We fell right into the lie of the great American dream, which is all about things. But God's dream for America is not about things. It's about Cape Henry. Taking his gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth from generation to generation. But God said, I'm going to raise, I'm, going to, I'm about to give them 
of my prophetic anointing. My prophetic anointing is going to adjust things and say, hey, 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 that's out of balance. Here's what God's saying right now. And at first that anointing was, 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 was somewhat elementary. Just pretty much limited to personal prophecy. You know, blessed art thou. Jesus loves you. God's going to open a door for you. Nobody can close. And... But he matured the gift. And forerunning families like this one right here. Who's his daddy. The patriarch as far as I'm concerned of the prophetic movement in the earth. Persisted in tapping into that anointing until we have now come to a place where prophets are doing exactly in fullness what prophets are supposed to do. Go do this meeting. Go to this place over here. There's a well. Go tap into this. And in the month of October, this will happen. But he wasn't finished, was he? He said, now I'll work my way back up to the first one. And I'm going to raise up people that move in my apostolic governmental mantle. And they're going to bring government, and wisdom, and order to all of this. And here we are. And the passage in Ephesians says, when they're all five working, we can reveal the fullness of Christ. I'm not even sure what that looks like. I know a good way, though. I'm learning. I'll tell you how to find out what it looks like. You want to know what the fullness of Christ flowing through us looks like? Look at Christ. You want to know what the fullness of the teaching anointing looks like? Families, including the kids, would sit on a hillside for three days with nothing to eat because they wouldn't leave this man's teaching. Apostolic authority is so great that when they came to take him, just so everybody would know, nobody takes my life from me, I give it willingly. And they said, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I am. He just released a little bit of his apostolic authority. And the whole Roman cohort was blown back a few feet on their hind ends looking up at him saying, who is this man anyway? And even on the cross, and in his lowest moment, the gates of hell couldn't prevail against him. That's whose mantle we're carrying. Don't you dare accept anything less. Reese said, the training is finished. It's time to go to war. And then he said, October, we'll see the turning of the war. He didn't say all the battles will be over. He didn't say two years and four months. I hate it when you give words like that. (laughs) 
two years ago when he said it. We can like it or not like it. And we've been in the slop and the swamp, haven't we? He didn't say there won't be four more months of slugging it out and dealing with it and getting rid of the crud. He said it'll turn in October. Reset. Return. Then he held up a scroll. You can tell me, oh great prophet, what this means later, okay? (laughs) Or I'll settle for either one of you two patriarchal (laughs) offsprings over here. He held up a scroll with a wax seal on it. And he said, this seal will be broken in October. And the words from it will be activated and will release holy all. And here we are. So we went to Cape Henry, Beersheba, and we took the flag, this one, this is the one that was given to me back in 2012. It started my journey. Started a new phase of it. We took an appeal to heaven flag. We took a U.S. flag too. We held the American flag out. It was very windy. People on each side holding it flat. Then we stretched this over it. Covered it like a cross. And for two hours that morning, this was a company of six prophetic people that were pretty weird. You'll know the truth. (laughs) They're all here. (laughs) They just decided a long time ago, When I become convinced he said it, I'm in, and I believe it. And like a gusher, prophetic decrees and prayers rolled out of us at Beersheba, the place of covenant. And we said, we now, like Abraham, can take out giants and see the supernatural power of our God released to this nation from Cape Henry, the place of covenant.